You are listening to The New Man, Beyond the Macho Jerk and the New Age Wimp. Your host is men's coach, Trip Lanier. Are you avoiding an uncomfortable conversation with somebody? Are you scared that something awful will happen if you're honest with them? And could it be possible that life might get better after you have the scary discussion? Today's guest is here to talk about having difficult conversations. Here's what he's learned after pulling back the curtain and telling his wife, coworkers, and sons he's gay. Welcome to The New Man. Today we're talking with Mark Silverman. He's a coach who works with entrepreneurs, sales professionals, and leaders. And you can learn more about him at markjsilverman.com. Did I get that right? That's correct. All right. Well, I mean, what I the reason why I wanted to have you on the show, we had that conversation back in, oh, I guess it was a couple of months ago. And um, I just, as you, as you, talk to me about this situation in your life. I just I just heard so many things that I've been as a coach working with people. Like I realize that the core of it is just they're there's some the thing that's holding them back is they're scared to have a, a certain specific conversation, whether it's with their l- wife or it's with their business partner or it's with a parent or a child. There's something in their life that is being bottlenecked, it's stopped because they're waiting to have this conversation and their their life is looking flat and dismal or narrow, or there's just something where everything's kind of come to this point and the next step is to have this conversation and they're avoiding it. And in fact, they're trying to find a way around it and they're, they're telling themselves they're stuck or they're lost or I don't know what to do. But in, in reality is it's time to have that conversation. And so you and I were talking, you told me about this conversation that you had with your sons and it just blew me away. And I was like, wow, this is, a, this is one of those really difficult conversations. And I could imagine you could see your life going in a, a whole different direction, depending on what happened in that conversation. You'd been avoiding that conversation and it was time to have it. So um, I was hoping that's what we could dive into today and we could, we could, we could explore that. Sure. What's interesting to me is, you know, I tell that conversation for the comedic value. I think <laughs> now in hindsight that it's a funny story. And then when you said, wow. That was deep. That was brave. I was surprised because I was just trying to be funny. Uh, but when it was happening, it was life and death. <laughs> That's funny, right? I mean, well, think about that. How often do we do we go back and we rewrite history? And hell, let me tell you this funny story. I mean, at the time, I was shitting my pants, and I was it was something that I was depressed about or I was avoiding for years. But now it's a funny thing. We 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 can look back on it in that way. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, let's get a little let's get a little context here. So, tell us about you as a younger man, uh, coming of age. Uh, tell us a bit about you, your lifestyle at that point. So, my coming of age was on uh, Long Island uh, in New York, and pretty pretty tough area to grow grow up, especially a, a Jewish kid in an all Italian Irish area. Uh, so it was it was it was an interesting way to uh, be an outsider. Uh, uh, getting into a lot of fights and, and and trying to come up, but as time went on, uh, you know, the piece of the piece of the conversation that I'll stumble over, especially given the the context of what your uh, podcasts are about, you know, is the fact that it, you know I turned out to be gay mm-hmm. at that at that point in my life, and and it was um, for me it was it, it was steeped in alcohol, it was steeped in drugs, it was steeped. In child, you know, when I was molested as a child, it was still, you know, all, the, all those ingredients that went into just a horrible lifestyle growing up in the 70s and early 80s. Uh, and I, you know, I, I went to college and uh, the first couple of days in college, I went to a uh, gay bar and they gave me a job as a bartender. And uh, I never went back to college and uh, drank, myself, drank myself silly and did drugs for the next 10 years. So that was, that was pretty much my life. <laughs> Wow. Okay. So, but that wasn't always your life. You you spent ten years in that place with alcohol, with drugs, struggling with, through that. You you, but you came through that. What happened? So, uh, what came through? I uh, I don't know if many of your listeners knows what Est from the seventies was. The worm, uh, the Earhart sensitivity training. Right. Uh, I I I hooked up with a group of people who got thrown out of there. 
Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, you got you got the you got the C team, huh? <laughs> I know. Actually, I got the A team who didn't want to be brainwashed. Uh, and Good. they and they and you know, basically, my my uh, my my partner at the time uh, was um, was friends with the people who were part of this and they, they brought me to it and we went, we went together. Long story short, we go to this workshop. That's a weekend long. We come out the other side. My partner says, I'm not gay anymore. And I say, me neither. Wow. <laughs> and, we just, and we decide to date women. And it's just not authentic for us and not real for us. And it uh, wasn't, so you're saying it wasn't authentic and real for you to be gay or it wasn't, is that what you're saying? Yes. That, that, the, okay. that, that was, that was, that was the, uh, the result mostly, mostly because that's what he decided. But I also, uh, the, the woman who ran it has a funny conversation about, uh, how I came up to tell her that I was really scared to do the weekend because I was afraid that my partner was, was really gay and I'm not. And she said she laughed her ass off cause I had long fingernails and earrings and long <laughs> hair. And, and she was like, this is craziness. Huh? But it was cool. It was the first step in me actually becoming um, a full and whole and and somewhat healthy person from being on the streets and and uh, being in, in in you know big trouble. I was I was headed for death and destruction pretty quickly. Okay, so the positive of it was that it helped you get off the drugs and the alcohol and that lifestyle. But at the same time, it had you say, "Hey, wait a second, I'm not really gay." It had it had me it had me question all of that. It had me question why was I with man, why was I doing, why was I doing what I did? Right. And I looked back at my childhood and what had happened to me and all the automatic things that pushed me in that direction. Cause I, th I think the whole thing is a recipe. I don't think, I don't think it's, uh, uh, I think we're all on the continuum when we get pushed one way or the other, uh, through circumstances and our, and our inner, inner being. So it's a combination of the two. You're saying that sexu our sexuality is that way? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, go great, great. I didn't expect to go this way with the conversation. Well, what the hell? Why don't we? Why don't we drive? Why don't we jump right in? Uh, yeah, I just I, I believe that I, you know uh, I was on the continuum of of uh, whether you know I had girlfriends in high school. Uh, I liked them. Uh, I liked them a lot. But then uh, you know I started gravitating towards towards men, and uh, that became my exclusive way of expressing myself for a long time. When this came along, uh, it had me questioning that: Who am I? What am mm. I? What do I want in life? Uh, and, uh, and had me look at, you know, I, I knew I wanted children. I knew I wanted, I was a, I knew I was a family man at heart. Mm -hmm. I knew that's who I was. That's who I've always been. And I threw that out with the, you know, the baby with the bathwater and never thought I could have anything like that. And this group of people showed me that there, you know, that some of what I was doing was completely made up. And that was really helpful to me. Okay. That, 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 um, and what I, you know, we'll, we'll go, we'll go. Fast forward to the end of this conversation. What I've learned is that my sexuality doesn't determine whether or not I'm a man, whether or not I'm a father, whether or not mm. uh, you know whether I'm a, a stand-up guy in the world. It, that that's you know my sexuality is just a small piece of that. Right. Uh, so so that you know it was that continuum, and I think I had to take that journey to get to this place to where you know Father's Day yesterday was the most special day ever. Yeah. Uh, okay, we um, there, there, that that is a big piece there. You you sent me that awesome video of your son uh, crushing the 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 game winning uh, run for the the championship the other day. So I, I just I know how much you love your kids and 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 how much they mean to you and and how tight you guys are. Yeah, both of both of them as of yesterday, both of them now have championships. So I'm I'm pretty excited. That is cool. Well, let's go back because we we haven't got to that part of the story yet. So you you start this path of personal development. You're cleaning up your life. You clean up your lifestyle. You've decided at this point that you're not gay. What happens then? So what happens then is I actually moved in with this group of people, and we we became a community of people. And I and I got married. I married a, a woman in the community, and we were married for four years. And we moved to California as a community, and it was uh, it was an interesting time uh, of bumping up against uh, old patterns and new ways of being. You know, these people they taught they they taught me how to sit, how to walk. They they were just showing me how I, I how I had become a caricature of myself. This wasn't inauthentic. They were showing me how to authentically be in my body, and it was it was it was incredible. I, you know, I, I I shed a lot of that persona I had put on. Uh, working in gay bars and being part of that '70s, '80s uh, culture, and I, I learned how to how to how to inhabit my body and be a man. I'm really grateful. I learned how to have sex with women and and uh, and be be a man in that kind of relationship. 
and uh, and learn to be responsible and 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 work and pay bills and do what I needed to do. So that was it was very positive. There was a lot of good stuff that came out of there. So, Ultimately, okay. well, I was going to say. So it, it sounds like you learned a way of being as a younger man living in that tough neighborhood and then responding to the whatever the life that you were in. Like this, okay, if I act this certain way, this is where I'm safe. This is how I'll be accepted. Or is that what it was? And then, and then and these it, people helped you kind of get rid of that and just come back to who you were. Is true. Yeah. No. That, that I, would, I would say. I would say that was that was the case. I, I have to say I've never lost a fight. I never lost a fight in school ever. Uh, everybody walked away pretty messed up. Uh, but <laughs> I always have to. I always have to throw that in. I want my kids to know I never lost a fight. <laughs> Um, I never started it, but I never lost it. Yeah. Uh, but then when I went into the bars and stuff like that, that was, that was where that persona and it came in. And then when, you know, living this other life, I really, I really learned how to, how to be, uh, uh, a functioning man in society. Okay. Got it. I'm just getting this picture of, of how painful that time must have been. I, I feel pain as I listen. It's like, man, it's like, where, you know, where's this part of you that's not able to have it? Your body that you're, and we all do this. We all have this persona. We all have some version of this. Like you said, it's on a continuum. Um, and so you you actually dove in and said, wait a second, I'm gonna I'm gonna figure out who I really am. And you had you had a you had a group of people that were helping you with that. You got married. Uh, tell us about that. Well, eventually, because because it came out of Est in the '70s, it was very confrontational always. And part of part of that whole S thing was to keep you off your game. On one hand, it's very healing, and you know there's a lot of useful stuff. On the other hand, I never was able to get an experience of myself. So often, when I would have an experience, uh, they would tell me that that's not the experience I'm having, and and it, it really spiraled to uh, to to where I got thrown out several times, and then the, the you know and, and I was and I was drinking again. I wasn't drinking horribly alcoholic, but every time I drank something bad would. <laughs> happen yeah. and, I, and I got thrown out of the community one last time and I decided I was never going to go back uh, got divorced was homeless for a little while uh, and and that's how I ended up with my brother here in Washington DC I was I was homeless driving around uh, the west coast living in my truck and I was kept trying to get him to wire me money I don't know if you remember back then Western Union was the only way to get money and I never knew that you had to be at the Western Union that he told you to, you know, that, that where the money was set up. So I could every time I go to a Western Union, they're like, "There's no money for you here." I'm like, no shit. <laughs> so as I'm driving across the country, my brother and I would have to, you know, I'd have to find a payphone, call my brother, find a Western Union. So I never got any money. So I, I, I had a gas station card that still had money on it. Uh, so I would, I drove across the country to come be with my brother. Uh, on a Unicall 76 card, I would get gas and food and live in my truck all the way across the country. So that's why I was, that's when, how I got to Washington. When, when was this? 1989, uh, August, September, 1989. I okay. was driving, driving, driving around living on Diet Coke and cookies. Was that the low point or are we, we still on our way down? Oh no, that was, that was, that was the low point of okay. my, I would, I would call that the, my, my, my bottom. Uh, cause I was looking at homeless shelters in Portland of all places and trying to figure out what I was going to do. And I came to Washington, DC okay. and, uh, to, to stay with my brother, get some food, figure out what I was going to do next. All right. So you the come to, you come to DC, you start to get on your feet. What happens? So I'm a hundred and I'm 130 pounds. I have no idea. I've been living in this community for years. I have no idea which end is up, which end is down. So my brother took me under his ring and my brother was, uh, uh, several years sober. Uh, and uh, pretty pretty successful in Washington D.C. He took me under his wing. He said, "You know, if you're going to stay with me, you're going to go to the gym every day. You're going to learn to run." And I was an asthmatic kid, and like, oh God, I'm running, and uh, and you're going to go to college. Mm. And I'm you know I'm 28 years old. Uh, I'd flunked out of college, and well, actually I quit. I didn't even have the chance to flunk out. And uh, so I started running, started hanging out with his friends. Uh, I got I started taking college classes, started getting straight A's in college. Uh, got a job as a waiter at a hotel and started working my way up and got sober and started to really become the man I, I was eventually going to become. I met a girl who I really liked uh, and we wound up getting married and I wound up, wound up climbing, climbing the ladder, making, you know, starting to make money, starting to make a lot of money, starting to become very successful. I graduate college. It takes me probably eight years to graduate college, yeah. but I did it uh, with, straight, with straight A's. Uh, and uh, I went from homeless to driving a Mercedes, you know, and having, you know, having a million dollar house 
two kids, wife, and uh, well, how long? Trip- uh, when, how long was that window? I mean, that's quite a that's quite a transformation. You're kind of blazing through here, but it took, so, a, it took about ten years. Ten, ten years. Wow. Ten years of working my way from a waiter to having them give me a chance to work in the office at the hotel, which they had never let anybody do that. And I, and I saw a fax machine for the first time in my life. Uh, and they, and they you know, learned, learned, you know, I, I was clean. I, I had this thing for office equipment and, and office supplies because my whole family has been in the restaurant business. So I never knew anything clean. And to me, an office supply store was clean. It was just so beautiful. I just love pens and pads and... <laughs> So that was that was that was a that was a whole lifestyle change for me to to have weekends off and to actually work a regular job. Right on. So you 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 you're living the American dream. You got two kids, a wife. You're driving the Mercedes. You got the million dollar house. Yep, I, I and, was committee chair for the Boy Scouts. I I, I coached basketball and baseball. It, yeah, it was a, it was a pretty pretty good life. And were you open with people about your, your past life of being, uh, being gay? And, no, and that and was, uh, that, as far as I was concerned, that was a closed chapter. Didn't happen. Uh, and I, I want, uh, you know, it was just an unfortunate thing. So people ask you about, Hey, what'd you do in your twenties? And you change the subject kind of thing. I, I actually admitted to being, uh, uh, an alcoholic and a drug addict. I never, I never shied away from that. I always told my kids that cause I want my kids to know what they came from. Yeah. So that was, that was not a problem. The fact that, uh, the fact that I was a, a pretty much a degenerate is not something I was embarrassed about. Okay. The other parts were. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, let's, 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 so what happens? You're, you live in the American dream now. What? So, so my, 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 ex, my now ex-wife and I were having a lot of problems in the marriage. There was, there was, you know, we loved each other and we really, uh, there was a lot of reasons for us to be together, but there were some issues that, that came from my childhood and, 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 you know, the molestation and things like that. And from her childhood that made us clash. We clashed uh, outside the bedroom. We clashed inside the bedroom. And again, I don't, I don't really know how much the sexuality uh, played into it. I, I have the feeling if I was completely, completely straight, we still would have gotten divorced. Hmm. Uh, so I, I, I tend to not dwell on that piece Okay, so it wasn't it, like you were. Wow, I, I don't want to be with a woman anymore. I want to be with a man. That wasn't a driving your dissatisfaction in the marriage. Is what you're saying? That was that was not driving my dissatisfaction. I was actually not consciously, being, at least. Yeah, I was. Yeah. I was happy being married. I loved. I loved my wife when we when we could get sex going. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. Uh, she really enjoyed it. In fact, when I did to come out to tell her, she's like, "I don't understand. <laughs> we had great sex." Oh, she was surprised. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, she's, and she for years she would say this just isn't the case. I remember what we did. I remember, and uh, and uh, you know I would say nope, nope, never enjoyed it. Wow, <laughs> and, was that uh, true? Course, you didn't no, enjoy of course, it? Of course I did. Oh, okay, I, I was I had to shut that off in order to make this move. But the the marriage had gotten really, really, really tough. Okay, to yeah, there was no way out, and I uh, I started to think you know a lot of it had to do with sexuality, especially given our both of our histories with that, it really started hammering at whatever budding heterosexuality I had. Uh, so that was, that was, that was an interesting, you know, again, I go back and I try and figure this out and it's, it's, it's not figure outable. Uh, it's just not something I can parse together and figure out what happened. It just did. And okay. I started thinking about men again. I just started thinking about that direction and that was, and I started thinking that that was my way out. Uh, so I, I I headed back in the direction of men and being gay, and I I started to dip my toe in the water, and it was it, you know it was starting to feel icky and real bad, and my integrity and my my value system, my love for my kids, my love for my wife was really a big deal, and I had met someone uh, that when I told was married I was married they they said they wouldn't go they wouldn't do any do 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 anything with me so we didn't have sex or anything like that. And I went and told my wife, I said, listen, I'm gay. I'm leaving. We're done. I can't do this anymore. Uh, actually, I, what, I, what I told her was I'm, uh, I, I, need, I need to get a divorce in therapy. We were in therapy. And she turned to me and she says, you've been telling me for years you're unhappy. And I never listened, which was huge. Huh. That was a beautiful thing that she did. Uh, you know, she acknowledged that she, did as, she had as much to do with this as I did. And... Uh, did she know at that point about you being a homosexual? She knew the past. She knew about the past. Okay. But then I, but then I told her that this was the reason. 
Mm. Uh, and the other reason was that we just were not nice to each other. We weren't kind to each other. And I didn't want my kids to see that. Mm. Uh, so, so I, I wound up moving out and just jumping into being gay full time. You know, that was my, that was the way I expressed myself. Okay. Uh, so you're still running your, you're still in the business world. You're doing your thing. you you got a divorce. How old are your boys now? Uh, my, at that time, I, at when the time. I left, my youngest was eight and my older guy was 11. Okay. Cause that's a big deal. I don't know how many guys I'm talk you know, I talk to and, and just even, even whether they're not even homosexuals, but just, just breaking up the marriage is, is the end of the world for them. Um, they can't imagine a life beyond that. They can't imagine healthy, happy kids beyond that. They can't imagine their partner being okay. It's just avoid that, that situation. So you we're just, I don't want to gloss over this. This is huge. Um, because we're going to continue on with the story here. So that was, that's a big deal for you to, for you to come through and, um, and, and to leave your, leave your marriage like that. Was there a concern about how you'd be a father or would, how that, how this would impact your, your, your kids? The whole thing, the whole thing was, was horrible. As, as, as you said, had nothing to do with the, whatever the circumstances were. My kids and I were extremely close. You know, the, the, they were, they were my life. And uh, we talked and we, we did things together and I was coaching them and it was just, it was, it was very, very tight relationship. And to have this happen was, was tough on them. My younger son really had a rough year. Mm-hmm. My older son, uh, a lot more pragmatic, a lot more heady, was a little stoic. You know, he said, you know, when I, when we talked about it, he says, you know, Mark, you know, you know, dad, I see you, I see you, I see you as much now as when you lived here. It really doesn't matter. It's okay with me. Hmm. Uh, just let me know when there's something I need to know. Because you're right down the street, right? You're in the same neighborhood. I made sure that I never lived more than walking distance from my kids. I've okay. still, I've, I've maintained that for the last, I guess it's been eight years now. Okay. Uh, I, I live walking distance with from my ex and my kids. All right. So you've left. You're still tight with your kids. Now you're full. You're out. You're gay, but not with, I mean, is this still in secret? Your wife it's knows how. It's still in secret. My wife, my, my ex-wife, my wife knew at the time. She asked me not to get divorced. She said, let's not get divorced, you know, since we're, you know, I'm still supporting her. I, you know, and I, and I wanted her to be a stay at home mom with, she was, she was a stay at home mom with the kids from the time they were born. And I wanted her to stay being a stay at home mom, even though I wasn't living there. So I paid all the bills, uh, even though I wasn't living there, made sure she stayed home with the kids so that they had uh, a, con- you know, a constant, made sure they could stay in the house. Yeah. Uh, uh, that was really, really important to me. Okay. And, and what I did was I, I, uh, I was over there, you know, the kids lived with her primarily uh, and I was over there all the time. Okay. Uh, just as, you know, and she made, she, she made it so that it was comfortable for me to come over and, and basically for the last eight years, uh, you know, it, people still don't know we're divorced because <laughs> we're, we're together in the stands at the baseball games. We're talking all the time. We go out to lunch together. Huh. We pair, we parent so tightly together, uh, that, uh, it's a, a surprise to some people. And, uh, so and, and and at this point, are you? Feel, I mean, at at this time, you know, you guys are starting to create create this new way and this new system. Are you feeling relief? You know, relief from letting go of the old way of living, or is it still feeling? You know, at what point does it start to feel like, okay, yeah, I think I'm on, I'm doing the right thing. I would say there was a part piece of relief, and then there was a gigantic piece of shame. You know, both of us for the first year, second year, were depressed. We were su- we were both actually suicidal. Wow. Uh, uh, we both we both didn't see a way forward at all uh, for us, but our kids were the most important. We both acknowledged that the kids were, were the guiding light. Uh, so we, we put all our energy into co-parenting and being there for our kids. That was the most important thing. Okay. So for a year, for a year or two, it was hell, even though it was the right thing to do. It was hell. Huh. Uh, even though I was, even though I was dating and, you know, having, having a good time here and there, any, every time my apartment door shut and I was alone, it was hell. Huh. Not having my kids under my own roof was hell. Yeah. Uh, knowing that I ruined their life was hell. Knowing that eventually they're going to have to find out why I ruined their life was hell. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you're under this idea that you've ruined their life because you 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 you're not living in this. You're not you're not uh, married to their mother anymore. Um, so at, at what point do things start to turn around and, and, you know, obviously we're going to have this big, difficult conversation. We're going to tell the kids what's going on. So for a year or two, it was hell. Then what? So then we start. you know, uh, I, I, I decided I was going to run the Marine Corps marathon, uh, and in training for the Marine Corps and I couldn't, I couldn't run anymore. I had bad knees, bad back, everything. I just wanted to do this thing. And that's a subject for another day. But I, I, uh, focused all my energy on making money 
for my kids and uh, uh, running the Marine Corps Marathon. While I was running the Marine Corps Marathon, I had uh, Brian Johnson's uh, philosopher's notes in my head. Uh, I, you know, I ran cool. with those every single day. And then whatever book was interesting, I put in my head. So I ran and ran and ran, filling myself with every piece of wisdom I could possibly uh, come to, 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 to learn how to live, mm. you know, and, 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 and I found some authors who really helped me build myself to, to, a, uh, to a good place. And, you what know, were when, some of the favorites that, the, that, that you would come back to? So I would, I would say the untethered soul, uh, Michael Singer, mm-hmm. I would Mark Nepo, uh, Pema Trojan, you know, just reading the, just reading, you know, what happened when your world falls, falls when everything falls apart, just yeah. reading her titles. Uh, then, uh, Alan Cohen, huge influence. He's a mentor of mine and, uh, you know, his books just spoke to me, you know, um, Steve Chandler, a lot of Steve Chandler stuff, yeah. you, know, you know, pound for pound, you can't get more useful paragraphs than what Steve writes. God, uh, he can write 25 words and just feel like, just kill it. <laughs> one of the few, one of the few emails I get every day that I actually read because he, he only takes a minute of my time, but he wants to make sure that there's, you know, I, I thanked him for something and I got, a, I got all these books in the mail again. Yeah. I'm like, that guy, that guy's really fun. So I always love getting the books. Oh, hold on. He's right here. Hey, Mark. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I, I, have just, the, I, have, I have the privilege of being fired by Steve Chandler. <laughs> client, so I, that's another story. <laughs> You're fired, Mark. Yes. All right. All right. I won't bust out my Steve Chandler impersonation. But. Love it. All right. So this, how, how long ago was this? This wasn't that long ago then. So, so th- this was over. So the Marine Corps Marathon was 2009. Okay. Uh, so I was listening to that. Uh, then, you know, 2010, 2011, I'm starting to really dive into the books that I learned yep. and really starting to, uh, and then I went, and then I went, uh, I, I, I was going to go to an Alan Cohen retreat a few years ago and I signed up for uh, just one of his spiritual retreats and he calls me up and he says, Mark, I have a hunch about you. And, he, and yeah, he says, I think you should come to my life coach course. Life coach, what the hell's that? Because you're in yeah. sales right now, right? Yeah, I was, I'm a sales guy. I'm a capitalist, uh, and uh, <laughs> you know, I, I like my Hugo Boss shirts. I like driving a Lexus convertible. I like these things. Yeah, you know? but I do. You know, I am very focused on making sure, especially when tragedy hits, uh, making sure that there's a path of love and kindness. And you know, I, I brought that into my business. Integrity, uh, service was really important to me. Uh, being you know 20 25 years sober now you know service is is my lifeblood to stay that way mm. uh so so it really spoke to me you know that, that and he said you know i have sales guys i have lawyers i have people like that who come to this it really makes their careers better and when i when i finally got to hawaii it's where i opened up and i knew it was exactly what i wanted to do uh and coaching coaching, coaching, was, coaching was what i was looking for yeah my whole life. It's what my, my ex-wife was telling me to do years ago. She wants credit for it. She says, this is what you should do. We didn't know what it was called back then. But, right. But, but you know, my, my whole life is about helping other people get to where they want to go. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and now, now we had a name for it. Yeah. Uh, so, so that was, that was a really cool transition. But in the middle of this, uh, we were, my, my ex and I went to a therapist and the therapist said, you know, I said, when do I tell my kids about this other blow that I have to give them, you know, the, the divorce was the first blow. Okay, I, I destroyed my kids with the first blow. Oh man, do you really they, believe that? That, that they, I did it that time. I did it that okay. time. I believe that even though they looked okay, I believe that I destroyed everything. All right, my uh, parents got a divorce, and I, I was just glad to see them happy after. <laughs> so it's like it was it was tough because uh, for years my younger son wanted wanted us back together. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for years my ex wanted back together, yeah. uh, and I you know I felt like a failure because again I, I'm defined by my family. I'm a family guy mm. and it, it just didn't didn't work but anyway I was dating someone for a really long time and my kids were coming to dinner with us every once in a while and this is this is my buddy Steve and you know they got you know they got to know him a little bit and the advice we got was the time it's the time to tell them when they start asking questions that's when they're emotionally ready to hear it or when they need to hear it when they start asking questions so it's about the time of my younger son's bar mitzvah he says mom uh it's really important that dad's friend Steve comes with comes to the bar mitzvah because he's really important to dad. Oh wow! And Robin goes, uh, "Mark, I think it's time to have that conversation." <laughs> <laughs> well, and I mean, did you shit yourself, or what? What do you think? Were you relieved? Uh, what was that like to to realize was, that it was time? Uh, 
Absolutely. I think we should have that conversation. You are absolutely right. That's the right thing to do. Oh, no. <laughs> I have a fucking chance in the world. And because was, why? I mean, in your mind, if my kid finds out that I'm gay and that Steve is my lover, then what? I, um, so again, dads will know this. You'll know this. I've seen you know, with your daughter. It, it, the closeness with my kids, the, the, just the sync, the sync that we were in. Mm-hmm. If, if, if I got one tiny fraction of division there, it was going to kill me. Mm. I, if they, you know, this is their teen, they're young teenagers. Does, how does this affect their sexuality? How they see themselves, how they see me in the world. Everybody always saw me as a little quirky anyway. Mm-hmm. So, you know, now this, what, what do I, what do I, I, I just could, I, I, the thought of it I, was, was unfathomable and it felt like, it felt like dying. It felt yeah. like, it felt like, uh, I was going to, I'd rather put, if I could put a bullet in my brain instead of do this, I would have done it. Wow. And, and we're, and we're like, well, maybe there must be a, I gotta, I gotta come up with a plan. Cause I don't know if that's what happens for me. It's like, okay, I gotta, I'll do it once I find the perfect way then, you know, cause the perfect way means that nobody's going to get their feelings hurt and there's not going to be no misunderstandings or whatever. Did you, were you searching now for the perfect way to do it or what was the oh, bullet yeah. that oh, way? Yeah, no, cause, cause it was like, it was like uh, weeks after after my ex and I had that conversation. We we're like, uh, she's like, all right, you got to do it. You got to do it. It's just time. You got to do it. I don't want you to do it. I, God, I don't want you to do it. But you got to do it. You got to do it. And I was talking to a, uh, another friend of mine who had a, a grown daughter. And he said, Mark, and he says, I can't tell you that it's going to be okay. I can't tell you that it's going to be wonderful uh, because you won't believe me. But I got to tell you, it'll be okay. I know you and your boys. I know your boys love you. I know what kind of a dad you are. It'll be fine. And he says, I can't tell you, you won't believe me, but I promise you it'll be okay. And that was, that was actually my, my, uh, courage. You could hear that. There was at least one voice that was, that was encouraging and uh, against all the other voices in your head that are like, this is the end. This is, yes. this is- so hey, it just, it just, I knew it just had to happen. Yeah. Okay, so then let, walk walk us through. Here comes the big. I can't believe I'm going to have this conversation. This everything could end right here. So I'm not a planner like you. I am. I am a. <laughs> it's right. It's right. Uh, I don't do role. I don't do role play. I don't do any of that stuff. I yeah. just, you know, I I try and be there in the moment. And so I go over to the house. My ex is there, uh, and I and I and uh, my two kids, and I, and we're supposed to. Uh, I don't remember what the circumstances were. Actually, we weren't going anywhere. So I go, hey, hey guys, come out, come outside with me for a couple minutes. Let's hmm. go, let's go sit down. And inside, you know, my heart's pounding. Oh yeah, uh, you, you know that, you know that. Oh you know yeah, that feeling where where it's like I'm not sure I'm going to be able to breathe. Uh, so we sit down on the on the steps, and I go, listen, I really want to talk to you. Uh, and I had already done the divorce conversation the same exact way. The divorce conversation was just as hard. This one, though, felt like the final nail. Yeah. So I see, in the, I see in the corner of my eye, my ex is in the screen door. She looks outside. She looks horrified. She, I, you know, it dawns on her what, what I'm about to do, and she runs away. <laughs> she bails on you. <laughs> She's just gone. And, and, uh, this is the funny part. This is the part you and I were laughing about. So we sit down. And uh, my guys go, Dad, what, what's up? What's going on? And I go, uh, I said, uh, you know my friend uh, Steve? And they go, uh, yeah, Steve. And I said, uh, you know, he's, he's more than a friend. And, uh, and <laughs> they look at me and my younger son goes, does that mean you're gay? Mm-hmm. I go, I said, yeah. They said, so Steve's gay? I said, Yeah. And they look at me for a minute and he goes, have you kissed him? And I went, yeah, of course. And he goes, ew. <laughs> <laughs> they both are like, ew. <laughs> oh, my, oh, shit. Uh, so then my elder son, he looks uh, at me and he goes, so say something gay, dad. I'm like, what? He says, talk gay. Says, Dude, I don't, I, I don't talk gay. He goes, he goes, act gay. Come on, act flamboyant. I go, dude, I don't. <laughs> don't do it. Uh-huh. Uh, and, uh, and he goes, you're no fun. So my younger son just throws his arm around me. He goes, dad, I don't care. I love you. Wow. And I said, did you guys know? They go, no, we, we didn't know. We didn't know at all. And, I said, and so, that, and then that was, and then they, they both go, uh, my older son goes, 
all right, can, can, can we go play uh, video games now? And I said, sure, just let me know if you have any questions or anything like that. And uh, I said, oh, by the way, on your way to the basement, would you just run upstairs and tell your mom that you're alive? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not sure she knows. <laughs> so, so, you know, they go in and they run downstairs and she comes out and she goes, I was upstairs in the bedroom, hyperventilating and praying. <laughs> she goes, oh my God, did you do it? <laughs> And so did you feel that that there was any division there? I mean, you, you got challenged. That was interesting, right? Your son's like, talk gay, act act a certain way. Because I I mean, in his mind, this is what gays are. And you're not, one, you're my dad. Uh, that's how I was interpreting that. Did you? Yeah, was, that, was, that was one thing. And the other thing is uh, the fact that my, fun, my, my, my sons tease me mercilessly and I tease them mercilessly is, you know, tells me that things are okay, that there was, that there was some semblance of okayness with that. Yeah. And I mean that that could have been a heavy moment, and then it. But was there an impact ever afterwards? Or, or I mean, so the, the next week we were looking for impact. We we had a therapist ready. We had all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And my younger son wanted to tell wanted to tell people. My elder son didn't want to tell. You know, he's just he doesn't. He's he's not. He's a, he's a more private person. My my younger son's much more social, and uh, he went. So we we get we we told him two friends that he could tell that we trusted. And I went and told the parents that they were my, about myself and that, that my, my son was going to tell them, their son, so he could, he could have support. Wow. Well, geez, that's, uh, like, that would be easy. Yeah. No, so it, it, was, it, was, it was really easy. Then I come home and, and the guy, one of the kids that my son tells is standing there playing basketball in the yard. I, I pull in and, uh, and my son says to him, hey, ask, ask my dad a question. You said you had questions. Ask him a question. And he looks at me and I go, you have a question? He goes, not a, no, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> nothing here. <laughs> and so bottom line, I mean, when was this? How long ago was this that you had the conversation? This was three, four years ago now. Okay. Yeah. Three, and, three, three years ago? Yeah. And so, I mean, you had the conversation. This was the thing that you were avoiding. Couldn't even imagine having it. What's life been like on the other side of this conversation? Uh, here's the... Having one life because I, I came out at work at the same time, you know, at that point to also, uh, I brought, uh, my current partner, uh, my life partner, I won't, don't want to call him current, it should be forever, um, on a business trip. And again, uh, you know, I'm a high, I'm, I was a high end sales guy in the tech industry, which is, is basically like being on a football or baseball team. Mm-hmm. And I brought, brought him on a, on a club trip to a tropical island and, uh, nobody gave a shit, which really was amazing to me. People I've known for 10 years, they just didn't care. Hmm. They didn't know, they didn't have a clue. Uh, and then when they found out, they didn't care. They just wanted me to be happy, which has been unanimously what what the response has been. I live in a small, you know, what seems like a small town here. And people see me with my partner, John, and with my kids. And my kids don't... The, one, the thing I was really afraid of was my kids getting teased. Yeah. And uh, they get no shit. No shit about it at all. My uh, kids come to my, my, my partner grills up a storm. He's from the South and he knows how to grill. So he grills all the time. Kids come to my house all the time for his burgers and his steaks and all kinds of shit. So it, it, it's been, there's been no repercussions. Uh, it's been really, it's been really great. It's, uh, it's just such a powerful story because I, I don't know how many of us are, are walking around. We've convinced ourselves that there's no life beyond this event, this, this conversation or this thing that we're imagining and um, the other part that I love that you brought up was like everybody cares, like everybody really cares what I'm doing or I'm thinking, and, and it's kind of one of those things like, wow, people don't really care <laughs> about me. It's like we we get we get that other piece of it. It's like oh, they they've got their own lives. They're 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 concerned about their own thing. They don't really give a shit about me or what I'm doing. And I, the interesting thing is that they when they did th- stop to think about whether or not they cared, they cared. They just uh, as long as you're happy. It's awesome. Yeah. You know, that, that was the cool thing. You know, the piece I didn't, what I want to say is actually the difference was we're actually closer. You and your Whether, sons. Because I'm real. They, they know, they know mm. the whole me. There isn't a piece of me that they don't know that I'm hi- hi- hiding from them. And that's for relation. You know, if we want to expand this, for me, what I've learned is my, my relationships deepen when I'm honest and when I don't hide anything. Yeah. Uh, I, I get to be, and, and it, you know, one of the things that was hardest for me to get in life is that I'm loved. I never, never was able to let love in from people. Hmm. And it was always because I felt like, like they saw the facade, they saw whatever I put out, but they didn't know the real me. 
And now with my kids loving me for who I am, knowing the real me and other people loving me and caring about me for the real me, it, I, I'm able to let love in and I'm, I'm able to be closer to people. Yeah. So I'm very close to my, my kids now. That's and it, it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. So, so the conversation had the opposite effect of what I thought it would. I'm glad you were wrong, man. That's great. Me too. Yeah. Oh man, thank you so much for sharing that. I mean, is there if you could go back in time in a time machine and be your own ally, is there anything that you'd want to tell yourself at some point? I know you had to go through all this and and to get to where you are at this point in time, but is there anything that you man, I I here's the lesson I wish I could have gotten sooner. Uh the the that's always a trick question because yeah. I will I won't change yesterday was the most the last two days, uh, my father's day weekend was the most perfect uh, I could ever imagine. And if I changed any any piece of my life, any conversation, anything I've done to change where I am today, uh, not I don't want to change a thing. Mm-hmm. The only thing I would love to be able to do is go, you know, put a shoulder and put an arm around my shoulder and say it's going to be okay. Hmm. And what I try and take from that, take from the things I've done is to be honest now, to have the conversations now, to 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 not be a, afraid of anything that real and the black backlash i try to learn from that Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so awesome i i don't have any doubt this is going to really help some people out there we're all this is such a human thing it's not about your sexuality or the choices that that you've made in your life and how you've responded to them we've all got stuff that we think well if somebody knew this about me they wouldn't love me or, or that if they if i had if i were to be honest about this or that then that would end this thing or damage this thing that I really care about. And, and we're all, that's just a, that's just part of our humanity. And so I appreciate you coming and, and sharing the story. And, and I love that you can laugh about it. I love that we can have a few laughs at it. Um, it, I you just bring a lot of humanity to this thing and it's a, it's some bold shit, man. My brother, my brother and I just had a conversation. I said, Oh, I'm going upstairs to be interviewed on, uh, this podcast. And I'm a little nervous because, you know, uh, this guy is you know, really big in men's work. And, uh, and, and being husbands and fathers and better men in society. And here I am talking about, you know, being gay and I'm self-conscious about that and being really vulnerable. Oh, and I, I said, you know, the other thing is that in our community, being vulnerable is much more important than being smart. Being real is much more important than teaching. Hmm. And, and, and my brother, who, my brother, who considered himself a cross between Rambo, James Bond, and a Kennedy, uh, says, <laughs> "How the f- fuck would you do to something like that?" Now, you know, he swims with sharks. He, you know, <laughs> he, 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 go, he bro- go, works at a tiger preserve. He does protective uh, services and stuff. And he's like, "How the fuck could you possibly do that?" I'm like, I'm like, listen, my, your world, your, your world, you know, when you jump in the, in the ocean with sharks, uh, you know, you, you know, you feel alive, you feel crisp, you know, your, 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 your nerve endings are crackling. Uh, when, 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 you know, when I'm vulnerable and real and I can be there for somebody else, that's my, that's my realm. I, yeah. I, you know, I did do a jump on a zip line when I, cause I was terrified of heights and I got that same thrill, but this is this is the place I choose to play. Yeah. So, so having this conversation with you is, you know, what we were taught how to survive. I love. Well, that's <laughs> such a big piece there, right? Like we can go do this this strong, you know, macho shit out in the world, or we can do this kind of work too. There's there's different ways of terrifying ourselves. If these interviews are helping you, then please visit the new man on iTunes and leave us a positive review so others can discover the show more easily. Thanks for listening.